to just pick up on that uh, theme. Um, better is one day in his course than a thousand days elsewhere. Uh, if you think about a thousand days, a thousand days is what around three years. In, better is one day in his course than a thousand elsewhere. And and I, I want to I want to talk about this this morning. I, I had like twelve messages, and typically the the worship will direct my word. Uh, but I want to talk about the power of a day. The power of a day. The power of one day in his courts. The power of one day in his presence. The power of what one day with Jesus can do for your life. One day can mark the rest of your days. Think about it. Better is one day in your courts. Like some of these these words and these themes, they come off our lips so quickly and so easily, but better is one day in your courts than a thousand days elsewhere. There is power in this day. (laughs) There is power in the here and the now. The Bible talks about the day of salvation. That today, if you hear his voice, don't what? Harden your hearts. What does God have in store for us this day? (laughs) What does he have in store for you this day? Or is this day like every other day? I just feel an anticipation in my heart that the Lord has marked this day for many of you. There is one day in your courts. What are his courts? His courts are where his throne is. And his throne is where his presence is. His throne is where he dwells. So better is one day near you than a thousand days anywhere else. And the thing about an environment like the upper room, we just worship for an hour and 12 minutes. And if you were in the courts of heaven, they have been worshiping for eternity. <laughs> It's the only right response when you get near him. And so we, were, we are in his courts right now because the presence of Jesus is here. So better is one day in this presence than a thousand days in the presence of anything else. But the thing about the presence is the presence is the, presence is the great revealer of where your heart is this morning. Like when the presence of Jesus comes into the room, he's the great revealer of where your heart has been. Am I right? (laughs) It's so true, man. I'm like, you can all look around and you can just, you can, you can see the presence of Jesus and and in, 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 in what he's doing. And I have good news. Your heart, your heart was created for the presence of Jesus. Your heart was made for an environment like this. And yet here's, here's what, I'm, what I've learned. Better is one day in your course than a thousand days elsewhere. Better is one day in your course than a thousand days elsewhere. But what has happened in previous days affects your heart today. And there's this theme, and we talk about it quite often. We talk about uh, the day, not in the courts, but the day of trouble. Have you heard me teach on the day of trouble? Have you ever? Raise your hand if that. Okay, good. I think it's, I think it's really worth mentioning, like in the day of trouble, your heart is affected in those moments. And oftentimes, a day in the presence of trouble can affect the rest of your days. Like how you process that one day, and then you come in the presence of the Lord today, and oftentimes what happened yesterday or in that day of trouble, because you didn't deal with it rightly, it closes your heart off to today and what he has for you today. And listen, the, the, the Lord, according to John chapter 4, it says that he is seeking this morning worshipers. Yes? Is this just some Bible? Just kind of finding my way, making a way. He seeks worshipers. What kind of worshipers is he seeking? He's looking for worshipers that worship him in spirit and in truth. So he's seeking worshipers. The Father's seeking worshipers. He's seeking worshipers that worship him in spirit and in truth. What is a worshiper that's worshiping in spirit and truth this morning? 
Think about it a bit. I mean, it's like it's, it's, it's neat that we know that scripture, but what does it mean that the Father's looking for those that will worship him in spirit and in truth? Well, I was sitting on that one time, and I, and, and I felt the Lord, the Lord reveal this to me about the type of worshipers that he's seeking. He's seeking worshipers that worship in spirit and in truth. And the two prescriptive measures for freedom, for your heart, are those two things. Where the spirit of the Lord is, there's what? Freedom. There's freedom. So he's looking for those that worship in spirit. And then in John 8, verse 32, it says, and you will know the truth, and the truth will what? The truth will set you free. So he's looking for those that worship in spirit and in truth, meaning he's looking for those who have been liberated by the spirit of God and by the truth of God. And so true worship, true worship is us returning a heart that's been freed by his spirit, by his truth, and we're presenting his work before him, and it delights him. But here's what happens is you get in an environment like this and the Holy Spirit is moving and oftentimes what hinders our worship are those things that we have not been set free from. But here's the good news is when the Spirit of God comes in to a room like this, he comes in to liberate. He comes in to create worship in you. He comes to liberate your heart. He comes either, either you are worshiping in spirit or truth or he releases his spirit and releases his truth so that you can worship Amen. in spirit and truth. You see, it's in environments like this that we get free. You don't need another sermon today. You genuinely don't. We need an encounter with the spirit and we need an encounter with truth. And some of us, some of us just need to be refreshed in it. Some of us just need our daily dose of spirit and truth. None of us have arrived. We're all on a journey, and we're going from glory to glory, strength to strength, faith to faith, hope to hope. So no matter where you are today in this room, you're in this room. You're in this room, which means you're in the fight, the good fight of faith. Faith in what? Faith in truth, faith in the spirit, faith in keeping my heart open before the Lord and before others. That's why I love the upper room. I love this community. I love the way that you have continually postured your heart before the Lord. We've, we've, we've learned to do that. Morning, noon, and night. Can I, can I, uh, can I show you something in scripture real quick? All right, good. Where the spirit of the Lord is, there is freedom. Let's all get free today. There, there, there is enough for every person in this room to leave liberated. There really is. That, that, that's the beauty of the Christian walk is that the work has been completed. It's just posturing your heart in such a way where you can see actually what he's provided for you. And so I want to I talk maybe through some things that hinder you from seeing rightly. And this, I, I feel like this may be a revelation that, that I haven't taught in a while. I have taught it, but I feel like it's so foundational for my life personally. Like it's just been so foundational. I, I go back to it time after time after time after time. And it's about your heart. Your heart is so very valuable this morning. Your, your heart. Your heart. Your heart. Your heart is it's so crucial, you understanding where your heart is today. Your heart is, is every issue of your life flows from your what? Heart. You know, Ecclesiastes 3.11, it says that everything was set up. Everything makes it beautiful in its season. For God has set eternity in what? He said eternity in the hearts of men. And then 2 Corinthians chapter 4, verse 6, says when you got born again, God looked into your heart just the way that he saw the earth was void, formless, dark. He looked at your heart in the same way. And he who spoke light into darkness spoke the knowledge of the glory of his son, like the face of his son, into your 
heart. And so it's so important that we know the state and condition of our hearts because our lives, our lives are dependent upon the state of our heart. We live from our heart. And, and, and it's really like we learn to shut off our heart. We learn to close down our heart. We learn to protect our heart. We learn to do a lot with our hearts. But in the presence of God, better is one day in your courts. In an environment like this, oftentimes the state and condition of our heart is revealed before him and us. And oftentimes we're like, man, are we still going to sing that song? Why are they lifting? You know, you start looking at others. You, you, start to, you start to reason and ration your way through it. And, and I want you to know those are indicators that, whoa, 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 what's going on with my heart? It's like the most common thing in the Bible. Uh, uh, you know, David in Psalms 27, he says, uh, just give you a couple quick scriptures. Psalms 27, Psalms 27, 3. You rolling with me, bro? Who's back there? Jojo. Mexico won the World Cup, or won last night, yesterday. I looked at my Instagram and Joe, it was like everyone was posting a picture of Joe Awesome stand up. He's our social media guy. Yeah, bro, stand up. He was like wrapped in a Mexican flag and like got tahine and tacos flying everywhere at your place. It was so funny. Come on, Mexico, let's do it. Tajin, man, my kids love tajin. Um, okay, look at this, Psalms 27, verse 3. It says, though a host encamp against me, my what? It's really, really important you read that. What is it? My what? My heart. My heart will not fear. Though a war arises against me, in spite of this, I shall be confident. And then he goes into verse 4. This is the famous Verse, one thing I've asked from the Lord, this shall I see that may dwell in the house of the Lord all the days of my life to behold his beauty, to meditate in his temple, verse five. For in the day of trouble, he will conceal me in his tabernacle. So it's just really important that David, David is saying this, he's setting this before him for his heart's sake. It's his heart. He's saying, whoa, 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 I've set this before my heart that though externally I'm surrounded and opposed and the odds are against me, yet internally I have positioned myself before the presence in the tabernacle and I know that he'll conceal me in the day of trouble. Paul talks about this a ton. It's like Paul's main thing. Uh, 2 Corinthians Chapter 4, verse 16. Check this out. Paul talking about his heart. He says, uh, blah, 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 blah. 2 Corinthians chapter 4, verse 16. Look at this. Therefore, we do not lose what? We do not lose heart. So this, this concept of losing heart threaded throughout the Bible. Like we, we know the number one command. We talk about the most common commands. Do not fear. But I think Paul... Paul would, would phrase it in losing heart, that when we give our over to fear, we're actually losing our heart or we're shutting our heart down. So one of the most common things he says is do not lose heart. So right here, therefore, we do not lose heart, though outwardly we're wasting away or decaying, yet inwardly we're being renewed day by what? So there's that thing, better is one day in your course than a thousand days elsewhere. We are to regularly renew our hearts in the presence of the spirit and truth. Because it's the spirit and truth that liberate our heart. That's why we worship him in spirit and truth. No matter what we're facing, we're worshiping in freedom, keeping our heart postured in such a way that he is doing what only he can in his home, which is our heart. I could look at Galatians five, uh, 6. Galatians chapter 6. Verse 7, do not be deceived. God is not mocked for whatever a man sows, that this also he will, will reap. For the one who sows to his own flesh will reap corruption, but the one who sows to his spirit will reap spirit. Uh, who sows to the spirit will from the spirit reap eternal life. Let us not what? Let us not lose heart in doing good, for in due time we will reap if we do not grow weary. So fear is something that loses our heart and also weariness or waiting.
You want more scripture? John 14. This is my jam, man. John 14. I was so bored when we planted the upper room because God, God told me to sit in a room and pray. We had this room, upper room. It was on the second floor. Whatever, looked downtown. He said, I just want you to sit here and minister to me and pray. And it was me and Jane. <laughs> and occasionally Truman would come. And, and the, Lord, the Lord had me locked in on, we were at, in an upper room, and I just, I just locked into the upper room discourse. Uh, the upper room discourse is Jesus' final words in the upper room. And man, I was just plowing through the upper room discourse, just day after day after day, reading this beautiful text. It's, it's now become my favorite section in text. It's, it's the red letters. It's the most red letters in your Bible. If you have a red letter Bible, it's like Jesus' final words. It starts in John 14, goes all the way through John 17. But I saw this thread throughout, uh, throughout this discourse, and it had to do with what uh, he, was, he was setting his disciples up for. And in John 14, 1, final words, check this out. We see the process of losing heart because the disciples would lose heart here. And so in John 14, 1, Jesus, final words to his disciples, he said, do not let your what? There it is. Do not let your heart be troubled. This word for trouble, it means to be agitated, for there to be inward commotion, for, for, this, for, for the external to affect the internal in such a way that, that you lose peace, you lose confidence, and you give way to fear. Now, here it is. Do not let your hearts be troubled. Listen, trouble, trouble comes in a day. Trouble comes in a day. How many of you have had a day of trouble? Like, I, 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 I were walking with someone who had a day of trouble two weeks ago um, at the upper room. It was a, a, a woman. What was, what's Pam's last name? Holland. Pam Holland. We need to pray for Pam. Hollett. Okay. We need to pray for her. Uh, two weeks ago, she found out her 19-year-old son uh, was murdered. She comes to the upper room. I've been on the phone with her. I know Kevin has. We've been surrounding her. She has community. Like in the day of trouble, what's, what, what you've built your life upon and where your heart is is revealed. And I've been in awe. I've been in awe of Pam's faith through this trial. She's two weeks in. We've got a long way to go. But, but the day of trouble came to Pam. I, I was with someone recently who was just diagnosed with, uh, with cancer. Uh, there was, there was a, a brother in Denver. Like, there's a day of trouble. And, and I'm, I, I'm convinced that, like, scripturally, he, there, there's a revelation here, and I want to show it to you, what to do in the day of trouble. Like, what to do with your heart in that day. Because your heart cannot handle trouble. It can't. No one's strong enough to deal with uh, the blows of life. And if we, if we are not equipped from a heart standpoint to put our hearts in the right place with the right people, man, we can get taken out so easily. And, and I see oftentimes people who have not dealt with the day of trouble. The day of trouble turns into a week of trouble, turns into a month of trouble, turns into season of trouble, turns into seasons, turns into a life where you're shut down, locked down, and you're just gritting your teeth, and you're surviving, yet inwardly you're just locked up. But the Father seeks what this morning? He seeks worshipers in spirit and truth. Spirit and truth. Spirit of the Lord there's freedom. You'll know the truth. The truth will set you free. He's looking for hearts that have been liberated no matter what they're facing. I just got to believe that the gospel, the good news of Jesus and what Jesus has done for you and for me, we can live from a different reality, different perspective because of what he has purchased. It's like Revelation chapter 5. I think biblical leadership is rooted in this. It's Revelation 5.5. 5. I, I, like heaven's leadership is found in Revelation chapter 5.5. 5. Revelation 5.5, 5, it's, like it's like, it gets me. Like I, my job is not to, 
I, I do teach. I, I do want you to, like, we, we believe in theology. We believe in, like, 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 giving you practical tools to live your best life today. Like, we love all that stuff. But as, as the leader of this house, Revelation 5.5 5 is my goal for you. Revelation 5.5, 5, it's an elder. Where is the elder? The elder's in heaven. What is an elder? An elder is a leader. An elder is a shepherd. And here's John showing up in the scene. This scene. It's like this great throne. They're singing. Like, you know, like it's just this glorious setting around the throne. And John begins to weep because he sees a problem. The problem is that no one could open a seal. But this leader comes up to John as he's weeping. He grabs him and he says, stop weeping. Behold, the lion that's from the tribe of Judah has overcome. Meaning the job of biblical, biblical leadership or biblical shepherds should constantly posture you so that you can see the one seated at the center of the throne, what he has accomplished in light of what you're going through, in light of the problem that you see. Biblical leadership says, you know, you've got to stop doing that so that you can see him. Stop weeping, stop being offended, stop living that way. Behold, 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 behold. And listen, I, I know, I know, I know what some of you, some of you have been through excruciating pain, excruciating loss, excruciating letdown. And I do not, I do not want to want to make, make light of that. But, but you cannot allow that to outweigh what he has done for you. You cannot allow that. You, you just cannot allow that. You can be honest with him. You can bring it to this place with other people. And again, the spirit of truth, the spirit and truth will liberate your heart so that you can be a worshiper in spite of what you've been through. And Jesus was positioning his disciples for that in John 14, verse 1. Do not let your hearts be troubled. Don't let this outward reality and what you're about to experience, because they are about to go through some trouble. A lot of trouble. A lot of trouble. And he is like, he's like setting them up going, oh, don't let your hearts be troubled. And he's going to start talking to him. And there's these beautiful words that come forth, John 14, Upper Room Discourse. And, and he says, I'm going to my father's house, many dwelling place, prepare a place for you. I will come again, receive you to myself where I'm going there. You may be also. And you know the way where I'm going. And, and there's two questions here uh, in verse 6 and verse 9. The disciples ask two questions based on what Jesus is saying. And I think these two questions are so so important for us to see and understand because when we start asking these questions, this is where trouble sets a root in our heart. He's going, listen, I'm going away. They have left everything for this man and they're like, dude, where are you going? We, we, we've been following you this entire time, but it's as if he's going to leave them. And so they start to get troubled in their heart by the questions that they're asking. And the first question that Thomas asks is in verse 5. Thomas said this. Thomas said, Lord, Lord, we do not know where you are going. <laughs> I'm not understand what you're saying. Do not understand where you're going. How do we know the way? And, and this is the first question that I see trouble brings often to our hearts. It's where is God? Where are you, God? If you are who you said you are, and you are where you say you are, then why am I going through this? Where are you? And then once we pass that day, there's this question that God abandoned me, God forsook me, God rejected me. And the further I get from that day, the more I've come up with a false narrative about God based on where was he? Where was he? Where was he when I was going through that? So it's really important that, that, that like, in faith, we understand the answer to this question, where are you, God? Because if you start asking that question, it's a zero for your heart. Second question, Philip. So the, the, Jesus, it's actually the famous, the famous line after where, uh, you know, where are you going? He says, I'm the way, I'm the truth, I'm the life. No one comes to the Father but through me. So Jesus answers him. I'm the way, Jesus is the way. 
And then in verse 7, he says, if you had known me, you would know my father also. From now on, you know him and have seen him. And then Philip asked another question. He says, Lord, show us the father and it would be enough for us. So Jesus is saying, I am the father of one. If you've seen me, you've seen him. But, but Philip is asking this question. He says, Lord, show us the father and it will be enough for us. And, and I think what Philip is asking is I think there's a question around the nature of God here. Like, what is God like? Where are you, God, and what are you like? What is the nature of God? Those are the two things I think trouble attack. Where are you? And if you were good or if you were loving or if you were this way, then why did this happen? So trouble attacks where he is and it attacks what he's like. Are y'all following me in this, everyone? There's two, I mean, there's just stop downs for us. If we get stuck and we start making the wrong agreements about Jesus, we start making the wrong agreements about where he was when we went through those things, our hearts shut down. And a shut down heart, man, again, it hinders your worship. It hinders you from living in faith. And so we've got to deal with those things as we walk through them. I'm such in a good mood. (laughs) This is so awesome. Like, this is where he's about to introduce the Holy Ghost, which is amazing because he's like, I'm going away, but I'm going to ask the Father, and the Father's going to send you a helper. What does the helper do? The helper answers these two questions, where he is and what he's like. That's the role of the Holy Spirit. That's why we have to make room for Holy Spirit, because Holy Spirit has the ability to our hearts so that we can see him rightly and we can know what he's like. But trouble, it blinds us from seeing what the Holy Spirit wants to reveal. So these guys are up here singing, we're jamming, better is one day, presence and glory. And what, what he's doing is he's revealing or opening the eyes of our hearts. We see the hope, the hope that's been set before us. But oftentimes because of trouble, because of things we brought in here, there's blinders over our heart because of agreements that we've made. And we don't allow the Holy Spirit to do what only the Holy Spirit can. Does this, yes? Yes. All right, so, hey, he's going to take them on a journey. What does he tell the disciples? Don't let your what? Don't let your hearts be troubled. Heart, the wellspring of life. Issues of heart flow from this place. Paul, don't lose heart. Don't let your hearts be troubled. Above all else, guard your hearts. He's going to say it again. John 14, verse 27. He says, peace I leave with you. My peace I give you. Not as the world gives do I give to you. Do not let your what? Do not let your heart be troubled. Don't let it be fearful. So he tells them twice in the same conversation. And he's going to keep talking. This a beautiful text. You got Holy Ghost, the helper, the guide, the comfort. And then he's going to go into the beautiful, I'm the true vine. You're the branches. Abide in me. Remain in me. You'll bear fruit. But then he's going to like turn up the heat. And he's going to say, listen, they're going to hate me. They're going to persecute me. They're actually going to kill me. And what they do to me, they're going to do to you. Now, this is not good news for the disciples. Don't let your hearts be troubled. I'm actually going to leave you. Don't let your hearts be troubled. Hey, listen, they're going to kill me. Don't let your hearts be troubled. And if they kill me, they're going to kill you. What are you talking about? In verse 16, it, I mean, these guys are just like, they're manifesting in the form of questions. <laughs> they're just like, they're like tweaking out because of what Jesus is telling them. And in verse, uh, chapter 16, verse 5, he continues this theme, but now I am going to him who sent me, and none of you asks, where are you going? But because... I have said these things to you. What has filled their hearts? What has filled their hearts? Everyone see that with me. What has filled their hearts? Sorrow. So listen. A heart that goes through trouble is susceptible to sorrow and to grief. And I actually think I actually think grief and sorrow are natural for our heart when we go through trouble. But just like faith is a substance 
It says faith is a substance for your heart. So is grief and so is sorrow. Sorrow and grief are substances that trouble produces in your heart. And they're listening to Jesus talk and they're not understanding what he's saying. And they're wondering where are you going and what are you like because things aren't turning out the way I thought they would. And when things don't turn out the way you thought they would, all of a sudden, (laughs) sorrow begins to fill hearts. Hope deferred makes the heart, okay, that sickness comes in the form of sorrow. Sorrow is poisonous for your heart if it's not processed rightly. Sorrow processed rightly actually can produce repentance. It can produce healing if it's positioned in the right way. But if you shut your heart down and let it fill up with sorrow, you've closed your heart off to the world. You may not know it. Like, you may not have acknowledged it and like, put a sign up that said, closed. But, but it shows up in the form of environments like this. It shows up in your marriage. It shows up in the way you treat your employees. It shows up in the way you treat your friends. Why? Because you're, you're protecting your heart. And it says here that these disciples, because of what they were hearing, sorrow began to fill their hearts. In verse 7, he gives them the antidote. He says, but I tell you, it is to your advantage that I go away. For if I do not go away, the helper will not come to you. But if I go, I will send him to you. You have to know that the Holy Spirit brings healing to your heart. And I'm going to show you how that happened in this narrative. But I want, I want you to see trouble. Day of trouble, don't let your hearts be troubled. Sorrow, their hearts were being troubled. Sorrow is filling their hearts. I want to show you the result the results of sorrow in your heart. Because from the upper room, where would they go? Upper room, boys, let's leave the upper room. Where are we gonna go? We're gonna go to the Garden of Gethsemane. What are we gonna do in the Garden of Gethsemane? What are we gonna do? We're gonna pray. We're gonna have a prayer meeting. Upper room is a house of what? House of prayer. Prayer is a great exposer of what's within the heart. So watch this. Luke 22, you see the effects of sorrow in their heart. Luke 22, verse 39, he said this, he he came out and proceeded as was custom to the Mount of Olives. The disciples also followed him. When he arrived at the place, he said to them, pray that you do not enter into temptation. And he withdrew from them about a stone's throw. He knelt down and began to pray. Now, just for a second, they're in a prayer meeting, they're in a garden, And Jesus warns them not to fall into temptation. What what is the temptation in a garden? Like when we think of temptation, temptation deals with sin, right? You're being tempted to sin. I said this before, but it's like, did one of them sneak a flask into the garden? I mean, when we think of sin, we 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 think of external transgression, Right? Like, like, what were they going to do that would cause them to sin? Well, Jesus wasn't talking about something external. He was talking about something internal. In the place of prayer, he's saying, listen, don't give into temptation. What was the temptation? You're going to see because they're going to fall into it here in about three verses. But it's just really important. Like, I think sometimes we're so familiar with these stories. Hey, don't fall in temptation. But what was the temptation for them in the place of prayer? Again, don't be troubled. Your hearts are filling up with sorrow. We're going to the place of prayer. Stay here. Don't fall into temptation. And Jesus goes and Jesus begins this glorious prayer meeting. He, this glorious, like, take this cup away from me. Not my will, but yours be done. And it says in, uh, in verse 43, it says, an angel from heaven appeared to him, strengthening him. In John 12, it says Jesus' soul was going through trouble. Jesus is processing his trouble in the place of prayer. And he's encountering an angel, and the angel is giving him strength for what he's about to face. But look at the disciples. Oh, oh it's, I mean, it's so intense. Verse 44 agony he was praying fervently sweat like drops of blood falling to the ground like like this is an intense moment in the life of Jesus 
But it was intense also for the disciples. But look at what the disciples did. When he, Jesus, arose from prayer, he came to his disciples and he found them sleeping. Now, we all know the disciples fell asleep, yes? Yes? But often, many of us think they fell asleep because they were tired. They didn't fall asleep because they were tired. Do you know why they fell asleep? It says it right here. What did they fall asleep from? What did they fall asleep from? Trouble, trouble, sorrow is filling your hearts. Don't give in to temptation. What is temptation? Temptation is falling asleep. Temptation is falling into unbelief, shutting your heart down, and just letting things flow. It's most exposed in the place of prayer, in the place when the presence of Jesus But it's in that place that you find the antidote for your sorrow. And we have to force our sorrow to that place. This is so good for some of you. It's putting language to things that you've been through. Honestly, it's putting language to things that you've been through. For me, I often share this in my teaching just because in, in, I just shouldn't grow tired of it because the thing that shut my heart down uh, the most was, was uh, my sexuality. When I was 13, I had a day of trouble. I was introduced to my sexuality or my sexual orientation was outside of myself. I, my dad isn't here, I don't think, but I'm still waiting for him to have the talk with me. Um, <laughs> but I, I, like, I like learned about my, my sexuality because of things I experienced that were wrong. And so that was a day of trouble for me. And so a day of trouble turned into a litany of sexual sin in my teenage years and early 20s. And so when I got born again, my heart was so beaten up and broken because of the trouble it had been through and the, the memories that I had and the litany of sin and the stronghold and the bondage. And all of a sudden Jesus says, hey, I want to live in that place, but we're going to deal with that. And I didn't know how to bring that to him because of the shame and the guilt and because of the sorrow and just the way that I had managed my heart around that sorrow. But he is so jealous for us to be wholehearted because he's looking for worshipers that worship in what? In spirit and truth. Spirit freedom, truth freedom, heart freedom. He wanted me to be freed from that sorrow. He purchased it. And so here I am, born again in this place. And all of a sudden, like, I, I feel like my life got worse. Depression set in, fear set in because I was now in tune with my heart. Well, what did I need to do? I needed to come back and understand the pain of that moment. The pain of how I wrongly dealt with the sorrow that I had experienced. And because of that, and a father in my life and community, man, I, I, am, I, I have received a process of sanctification and wholeness in my heart. I got four kids, beautiful marriage. I'll stop there, but I could keep going <laughs> about how fun marriage is and what God designed for me and my sexuality and what the enemy tried to steal. Have I arrived fully? No. Man, I'm a lot further along than I was. And I'm in environments like this where the spirit and truth are still liberating my heart to move in freedom. No one's arrived. So here's the disciples. Trouble, trouble, sorrow, sorrows filled your heart. They gave into temptation and they're asleep. Their hearts were shut down. So from this place, the Garden of Gethsemane, Judas is about to come with a, just a, you know, the soldiers and the whole nine yards and, and going to be betrayed. He's taken to the public courts, slapped, beaten, spit upon, falsely accused, judged, left alone. 39 lashes. Ribbons of flesh peeled off. Crown of thorns upon his head. He goes to the cross. It's the beautiful, amazing offering of Jesus. God's own son. Perfect, perfect sacrifice for us. Yeah. 
talk about a number of things that happened to Jesus on the cross, but you know how Jesus died? Jesus actually, it says that his heart melted like wax, like there's a scripture about what was taking place in his heart. Jesus actually died from congestive heart failure, like his heart just shut down. His heart broke. His heart died. And at the same time, although externally the disciples weren't dying internally, that's what was taking place to their hearts as well. Their hearts were just shutting down. Complete despair. Complete despair. Everything they thought would happen or the way things would turn out, it turned out the exact opposite. It is the darkest night for these 12 men. Now, Jesus, Jesus is amazing because Jesus actually offered this prophecy in the upper room discourse. There's this one little prophecy, one scripture. It hit me one day. It's so powerful. It's in John 16. I love this verse. John 16, verse 21 and 22. It says, this is, this is uh, I love this. It's starting 20, actually. It's, it's this thing that they could have hung on to. And what I'm realizing is that the Lord is in the midst of it all. Like the Lord oftentimes gives us promises, scriptures, words, just to hang on to, to get us through. But sometimes it's just so subtle, you can miss it. But if, if, if you'll pay attention, like you can anchor yourself in those moments when he comes. I'm, I'm convinced of it. I'm just convinced of it. And I think he'll do it more than once. And it's, it's like, it's how we fight the good fight of faith. It's like faith comes by hearing, hearing the word. And there's a word here for them to walk in faith through what they're about to go through. And I love that Jesus always supplies your faith. He does. He's the author and perfecter, supplier, continual leader of your faith. Don't check out. This is so good. Watch this. Watch this. Watch this prophecy. John 16, 20. Truly, truly, I say to you that you will weep and lament but the world will rejoice, you will grieve. That grieve, same as sorrow. But your grief will be turned into joy. There's part of the word. Whenever a woman is in labor, she has pain because her hour has come. But when she gives birth to the child, she no longer remembers the anguish because of the joy that a child has been born into the world. So look at verse 22. This is, this is the prophecy. Therefore, you too have grief or sorrow now, but I will see you again, and you're what? And you're what? And you're what? And you're what? Your heart will what? Your heart will rejoice. Your heart that's being filled with sorrow, your heart that's going through trouble, you will see me, and when you see me in that moment, your heart will rejoice, and no one, everyone say no one. No one will take that joy away from you. No one. No one will take that joy away from you. No one, no one will take that joy away from you. So, so can I show you where this happened? Because this isn't, this isn't ethereal, like when he gets to heaven, this, this actually took place and you'll see where their hearts are restored. So after he was crucified, murdered, put in a tomb, they went back to the upper room. They went back to the upper room. Flip over to John 20. Is this good Bible? I love my Bible. We got this song for our kids. I won't sing it. All right, Easter Sunday. Do y'all remember Easter Sunday? You can't forget my sermon on Easter, can you? Okay, many of you did. It was five words. Mary came announcing. The first, the first gospel sermon was five words. I have seen the Lord. That was the first gospel sermon. I've seen him. So Mary comes announcing to the disciples, hey, I've seen him. But listen to me. This is what I'm learning even about Mary. Mary saw that the tomb was empty and then the angel sent her on her way. But when she was leaving the tomb, Jesus encountered Mary. And it wasn't just hearing of the empty tomb and seeing the empty tomb. It was seeing the resurrection. It was seeing the resurrected one. And so the disciples are in the upper room and they've heard the gospel. Hear me. They've heard the gospel. What's the gospel? I have seen the Lord, meaning the Lord has risen. I'm sure Mary explained more than that, but listen, they weren't convinced themselves. Because after she says that in verse 19, look at this. 
so amazing. In verse 19, it says, so when it was evening on that day, the, the, the verse 18 is, I've seen the Lord, announcing to the disciples, I've seen the Lord. But when it was evening on that day, so maybe they heard it in the afternoon, the gospel, I've seen the Lord, he's resurrected. But Mary is now with the disciples, and look at the state of the disciples. It was evening on that day, the first day of the week, and when the doors were shut, where the disciples were for fear of the Jews. Listen, this is a prophetic picture of what happens to hearts when they go through trouble. They get shut, locked up because of fear. Fear of what's out there. Fear of what I don't want to go through again. You following me? So here they are. They're locked up in the upper room, shut down. They've heard the gospel. And look at what happens. Jesus came. And stood in their midst and said to them, peace be with you. What a scene. Here's the beautiful news. If you're locked up, shut down, and closed off to the world, Jesus can still walk through those walls and reveal himself to you. Like, however, however committed you are to that offense and unforgiveness and your teeth are gritted, he can walk right through every wall that you've put up. I have such faith for some of you that have no faith today. I feel it in my heart for you. This is the day. Better is one day in a thousand courts. Better is one day in his courts. This is what a day in his courts will do. He breaks down your walls. Look at what happens. He says, peace be with you, verse 20. And when he had said this, Remember the prophecy? You will what? You will see me. You remember him saying that? And when you see me, what will happen? Your hearts will rejoice. So look at this. Verse 20. And when he had said this, he showed them both his hands and his sides. Then the disciples what? Rejoice. What happened to their hearts in this moment? They took heart. How did they take heart? They saw the resurrected king. A glimpse of the resurrected one changes everything for your heart. This is Revelation 5.5. 5. Behold, the lamb has overcome. Right here for the disciples. This is the foundation of the church. And this is the foundation for your walk with Jesus. That no matter what you've been through, no matter what you're going through, no matter what you will go through, that you have access to see and behold the resurrected one who will provide all that you need for life, godliness, faith, peace, love, joy, hope. I'm fighting the good fight of faith. Next thing he says, says, so he said to them again, peace be with you. As the Father sent me, I also send you. And when he had said this, he breathed on them and said, receive the Holy Spirit. It's changed everything for the disciples. They received the Holy Spirit, the helper. He came. He would come again. But I believe this work was for them internally. I believe the next work would be for what they did externally in power. Today's the day. Today's the day. Change the narrative today. I feel it in my heart. I, I, the, the image that I have, when I pause, the image that I have, and I've, I've had it before, but I saw the Lord uh, just now in my, in my heart. I saw him just, he's like so ready with a pen 
to place that pen upon your heart and to write a new story. And it's his, it's his story. It's a story of faith. It's, this is fighting the good fight of faith. It's not, it's not you, don't, you don't walk by feeling. You don't walk by experience. You walk by faith. And you've heard the word now for your heart. And now it's letting your heart dig into this and say, I'm going to let go of the sorrow. I'm going to let go of the pain. And I'm going to choose, Lord, to allow your Holy Spirit to do what only it can. And then you become a worshiper of spirit and truth because you've been liberated. This is the gospel. Yeah. 